Hey, welcome to Generation at Home. We're so excited and so thankful that you made the decision to log in and tune in to this online worship experience. This is gonna be an interactive experience. It's gonna be a lot of fun for the entire family. As a matter of fact, if you have littles with you, we want you to text in the word GKIDS to the number 97000 so that you can get access to all of the online resources from music videos to lesson plans and curriculums that we have prepared for your children to enjoy in the comfort of their home. But listen, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up during the worship experience. I want you to just kind of pray, lean in, and just have church wherever you are. This is Generation at Home, and I hope you're ready. Come on. fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same God who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes I will lift you high in the lowest valley yes I will bless you
worship you. I worship you. You are here working in this place. I worship you. I worship you.
Hey, I hope you enjoyed that worship experience. What an awesome time we spent in the presence of God. You know, even that song, Waymaker, has so much weight in our community because we believe that God is still a God of miracles. Come on, we believe that He is faithful to His word, faithful to keep His promises, and He will make a way where it feels like there is no way, man. What an awesome, awesome moment. Hey, I want to let you know as we get ready to get into a conversation about Jesus, a conversation about hope and peace, um, that you can go ahead and prepare all, all of the kids' curriculums that we have already made available to you, whether you want to have that time with your children afterwards, if you want to use it in the, in the middle of the week, you can. But you can just go ahead and prepare a time for that. The kids are going to have a great time with you as you lead them into song, as you lead them into the lesson. So parents, mom, dad, make sure you take time to do that with your kids. Text in the, the word G Kids to the number 97000. And if you just want to be updated on what's happening with Generation Church, what, 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 what we got going on where are we in times like this text the word generation home generation home to the number nine seven zero 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 amen hey so i want to just have a conversation um today about jesus but all of, uh, just really on on the idea of wrestling and embracing this has been a talk amongst our leadership really a talk amongst our church family and community because I think it's important that we understand that we're not just always just encouraging, right? And just saying, hey, we're projecting our faith towards new things and to better things. I think it's important that we as believers and followers of Christ have conversations about trials. That we have conversations on, on how it is to process difficult times. How it is that we can get through painful moments and painful seasons, right? Not just talk about mountaintops right but how it is that we can still lead how would it how it is that we can still be fruitful in hard and difficult moments you know it's no surprise that we're in a, in a hard and, and just difficult time right now not just as a city not just as a country but as an entire world we're navigating really uncharted waters when it comes to the coronavirus and so how do we process times like these how do we get through times like these it is important that we have conversations about this too so i want to teach for a little bit on this topic wrestling and embracing and if you take one thing at home today if you can just take one thing with you from this talk is this god is good god is good god is love and god is victory i'm going to say that one more time come on believe this with me god is good god is love and god is victory Having that understanding that God is good will help us and really just help us get an understanding that God is good regardless of what our circumstances look like. I think for too long, people believe or just Christians believe that God is good because of my circumstances or God is good in the middle of, of my time or my seasons because I see him working. Whether it's whether my marriage is thriving, God is good because of that. Or God is good because my kids are healthy. God is good because, because my finances are flowing. God is good because I see his hand and I'm living the American dream. But what I want to challenge you today and what I want to just kind of bring to the forefront today is this, that God is good regardless. God is not good contingent on our circumstances. God is good in the good times and in the bad times. It doesn't change his goodness. Come on, agree with me here and now. It doesn't change his love. It doesn't change his character or his nature. We need to understand that God at the end of the day is good, not because of what we see with our eyes. He's good because of the cross of Jesus Christ. Come on. He's good because he already paid the ultimate price for us. He is good because he already put grace on full display. He already gave us mercy that will last forever. That is why he is good. Come on, to have the understanding that God doesn't owe us anything. Right now, He doesn't owe us anything. He's already given us enough. Amen. I'm going to introduce you to a biblical figure that has an interesting name, and, and I think it's a fun time just to repeat this with me right there in your living room or on your phone. Wh whoever you're watching with right now, say this name with me. Ready? One, two, three. Habakkuk. One more time. Habakkuk. Yeah, I know it's funny. 
I know it's interesting, You're probably saying, Rich, what do you, who is this? Why does it even matter? Habakkuk is a minor prophet in the Old Testament. He's somebody who has a real short book. It's only three chapters long, but I think his reflections um, with his time with the Lord, his, his, his writings are so crucial to just really helping us understand the times we're living in now. You know, Habakkuk is, is a figure who was very different to, to the way prophets um, or the way we saw prophets operate in the Bible. Habakkuk is not uh, what typical prophets would do, which is speak to people on behalf of God. Habakkuk was a prophet who would speak to God on behalf of people. Really, his three chapters really focus in on him complaining to God. He's taking so much time, and this is 600 years before Christ, and he's taking so much time to just really get into God's presence and complain, right? Be angry with God. He's frustrated with God because what happens here, just a little bit of context, God's people had been blessed. They've been blessed for a good amount of time, and now they were entering into a season of corruption, of deception, poverty. Judah was going through so much in this time. And Habakkuk, this prophet, is complaining to God. He's saying, man, why does it seem like right now you're not being fair? Have you ever asked that question? We can be real. I've asked that question plenty of times in my life as a follower of Jesus where I've come to God because I'm going through a lot of hardships or I'm going through a difficult time. And I ask God, God, why does it seem like you're not being fair? I think this is a fair question. I think, it's a, I think it's a natural human question to ask God, why does it seem like all of your promise say something completely contrary to what I'm seeing and what I'm experiencing right now? I wanna just start here, Habakkuk chapter one, verse two through three from the New Living Translation, just so you get a little bit of context of what he's saying and what he's feeling. He says this, how long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you don't listen. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you don't come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Must I watch all of this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and I see violence. I am surrounded by people who love to argue and love to fight. That's his cry. That's the very first of the writings we see of this prophet, and he is exemplifying the feelings of God's people, where people are in pain, they're going through tough times, and it feels like God is not with them. It feels like God has forgotten about them. And if I can be honest with you, I've felt this way so many times, and maybe you're watching this right now, and you're saying, yeah, Rich, I can relate to this. Where it feels like, man, God is not healing me from my sickness, where it feels like, God, you can intervene at any moment right now and heal my dad or heal my grandfather or get me through this financial struggle that I'm going through right now, this, this betrayal that I'm experiencing right now. And at the moment, I feel like you are not with me. What I love about this prophet, Habakkuk, is how real and how raw it is. Come on. I know I've had similar prayers to this, man, where I'm just real with God. I'm not, I'm not, oh, holy thou art, are you, when I'm coming into his presence. I am raw. I am in my full version of all of my emotions wrapped up, and I'm coming to God saying, Lord, I feel like you are not here. And this is Habakkuk. And as a matter of fact, even his name, that name Habakkuk, tells a story, tells all of our stories. His name means one who wrestles and one who embraces. Think about even the tension in those two words. One who is wrestling and embracing. One who is fighting and yet leaning in. That is what his name means. He is frustrated in his time with the Lord, but he is also leaning in. He's also embracing at the same time, God, you are good. God, I know that there is still something on the other side. Here's a question that I have for you. Maybe you're like me, or maybe you can relate to Habakkuk. Maybe you've been there. Maybe what you see in this moment or what you've seen isn't adding up to what you believe. So what do you do? Come on. What do you do when what you're seeing isn't adding up to what you believe in your heart, to what you built your life on? You know, sometimes in life, Life will throw a lot of curveballs our way. Life has a funny way of just having us go through valleys and go through tough times. Even as followers of Christ, we've been learning and having the conversation that, yes, if we follow Jesus, yes, we're believers, but that doesn't exempt us, right, from life. 
we still have problems just like everybody else has problems. We're still gonna go through pain, we're still gonna go through loss, but even in that, we have to understand and we have to kind of recalibrate that God is with us. Because here's what's gonna happen, sometimes in life, you're gonna have real good moments, real good seasons, and then something's gonna hit. Sometimes in life, right, you have a really, a really healthy marriage and all of a sudden some years go by and one spouse betrays the other and instead of owning up for the mistake, you're blaming the other side for not doing what you, sh what, what you thought should have been done or what they thought should have been done. Maybe in life you have a really good job and things are going really well financially for you. All of your ambitions are starting to fall in place and an economic crash comes or, 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 or business decision is made and things begin to fall short and now everything changes. Maybe you have a good life and maybe along the way in this good life that you have you get sick and you rally in community and you beat the sickness and maybe a, years, a few years go by and now you get sick again what do we do when this tension hits? What do we do? How, how do we respond? Here's the answer. We need to wrestle and embrace. In moments like this, in times like this, maybe you're saying, Rich, I've never gone through something like that. I just want to prepare you. Life is life and we will go through it at some point, an, a point or another. And we have to have that understanding that in those times, we are called to wrestle and embrace. Habakkuk, really feels like this. And he's asking three questions. He's asking three questions in his short three, three chapters. Number one is this, God, why does it seem like you don't care? Why does it seem like you're not doing much when I know you can? And why does it seem like you are not being fair? I think those three questions are very similar to the questions that we often bring to God. And so here's, here's what I want to kind of teach upon. And I'm, I'm going to kind of get creative in a little bit, but here's, Here's another key point. Is it, okay, is it okay to question God? Is it okay to question God? Is it okay to ever push back on God? Is it okay to ever question the plan of God, the will of God in our life? I think for a lot of us that has a lot of taboo. Well, God is in control and God knows best and God has a plan for me not to harm me or to prosper me. Come on, I think for a lot of us we've, we, we've quoted that verse, but is it okay to push back? And here's what I want you to know. It is not unholy. It is not wrong. It is not bad for us to kind of wrestle with God in that space, to question what God is doing. As a matter of fact, one third of the Psalms are writings of believers that are, that are groaning, they're crying, they're frustrated. God, why does it seem like in the middle of my pain, in the middle of my sorrow and my trials, you're not with me? Books like Lamentations, Jeremiah and Job express express what appears to be unjust stuff for the righteous. So is it wrong? No, it's not. Even Jesus has a moment when he's hanging on the cross for humanity. He has a moment where he turns to God and says, God, why does it feel like you've forsaken me? Why does it feel like you've pulled away from me? I want to go ahead and take this time to just kind of show you how it is that we can process in this difficult time. I want to teach for a moment. I think this visual will really help us understand what, number one, a Christian's life looks like, right? But also, number two, what a, va what a, what a life of growth looks like, what a life of processing in community could be, and what a journey of faith truly is. This is what it, this is what it for a lot of us, will look like. This is what we call mountaintops, right? This is our life. We're born here. Everything's good. We start growing. We have a beautiful moment where we hear the gospel for the first time, right? We're now encountering a life in Christ. Everything is phenomenal. Every worship song is for me. Every message is described to just re really to relate to me in a, in a beautiful way. I'm living on the mountaintops. God is good. I'm telling everybody in my world about Jesus. I'm serving, I'm tied in, I'm giving, I'm living outside of myself. This is the mountaintop. And because, again, life is life and we're all going to go through it, sometimes, right, it starts to go this way. And we go from the mountaintop, right, now down this slope, and this is what we call a valley. 
What happens between the mountaintop and the valley is crucial. Craig Rochelle, Pastor Craig, describes this moment, the in-between, as a crisis of beliefs. A C O B in his book, Hope in the Dark, which I, I, I just encourage you to, to read it. But this is the in-between where we lose our job. Maybe our, our marriage is in a rocky place. Maybe one of our children want nothing to do with us and they've gone wayward. Maybe we've lost a friend or two. We're going through a season of pain and now we're here. And what most of us think when we're in this moment, a lot of us, most of us think that we have two options. Option number one would be to go this way and deny the entire moment, deny the entire season, be weird about it and pretend like nothing's happening. But for a lot of us, when we hit a crisis of belief is this way, where we truly say, I've tried God and God doesn't work. Jesus didn't work for me. I prayed, I went to church, I gave, I served, I believed his word, and yet I ended up here. So for many people, when we hit the crisis, we either deny it or we walk away from God. But what I want to encourage you today in this conversation is what if I told you that there is more than just option one and option two, but what if I told you that there is a third option? And the third option is to wrestle and embrace. Mountaintops and valley, not to walk away, but to wrestle and embrace. Because here's what this life will look like. When you decide to wrestle it down with God, when you decide to lean into God and lean into the valley, lean into the moments that you don't understand, lean into the pressure, here is what typically begins to happen in this time. For many people that think of a life in Christ, a life of faith, for many people, they think that it's from mountaintop to mountaintop. But if you study the Word of God, come on, if you've been following Jesus for a little while, you know exactly what I'm talking about, that we don't live from mountaintop to mountaintop, but we go through life. And oftentimes we're going to go through some valleys. We're going to go through some hardships. We're going to go through some pain. And what we decide to do in the valley will dictate what the future will look like. Because come on, the Bible says that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, come on, it doesn't say I won't walk through the valley. It says even though I walk through the valley. God is with me. Come on. God is for me. I can praise God on the mountaintops. I can bless him for how good he's been to what I see all around me. When my family is healthy, when things are good, I can cheer for him there. I can bless him there. I can praise his name there. But come on, the valley is where I get to intimately know him. It's in the valley where I get closer to God. It's in the valley where my faith gets stronger, where my faith gets bigger. It's in the valley where maturity begins to happen. It's not from mountaintop to mountaintop. If my faith is here today, it's because I wrestled and embraced in the valley. Some of you are in a crisis right now. And here's what I want you to know. If you want to write this down, maybe you're journaling as you've been following along in this conversation, write this down. A committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions and embrace a genuine faith in God. I'm going to say that one more time. A committed believer can both wrestle with honest questions and embrace a genuine faith in God. You can do both at the same time. And I want to just show you that real quick in Habakkuk and how he processes it in the same way, which is Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 12 and 13. Watch this. O Lord my God, my Holy One, you are with me. Embrace. Surely you do not plan to wipe us out. Wrestle. O Lord, our rock, embrace. You have sent these Babylonians to correct us and punish us for many sins. Wrestle. But you are pure and cannot stand the sight of evil. With you, with you, at, you wink at their treachery. Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up more than the righteous ways? He's wrestling and embracing at the same time. He's leaning in. God, you're good. God, you're with me. But at the same time, asking the questions. 
maybe you can relate to this right now. Maybe you're saying, Rich, this is me, man. This is, this is where I'm at with God. And what I want you to know is that God is right there with you. God is not some far, far away God distant from you. No, no. He is close. He is with you. And God understands your pain. And here's some better news. God not only understands your pain, God welcomes your questions. He rather you yell at him than you walk away from him. Because he has the bandwidth. He has the capacity to be able to hold and take all of your frustrations, all of your pain, all of your questions. When we hit a crisis of belief, understand that God is right there with you. Don't deny it. Don't walk away from it. Wrestle and embrace. Let your doubts drive you to continue to embrace and wrestle God. Here's what you need to know. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is the very means to overcome the doubt. It's the very, the very thing that will help us overcome it, right? It's the type of faith that just says, even though right now it doesn't make sense, even though I don't see God working right now, right now, I know that God is here in this moment. I know that God is present and I know that God is paying attention. Habakkuk in chapter one is wondering where God is. He's wondering, God, why don't you seem fair? In number two, in, cha in chapter two, he is anxious. He is angry. He's worried that God is just going to disappoint him and disappoint God's people. But what's interesting here is this, in the final chapter, in Habakkuk chapter three, the entire tone changes. He now goes into what the Bible calls, it's a funny word, but it's a word called shijanon. And it's a word where he is now really praising God from the depths of his soul. We only see this word twice in the Bible, once in Psalm 7 when David uses it, and the other time here when Habakkuk uses it. And it is just this, this type of desperation, right, from the depths, a very heartfelt praise and a worshiping of God to say, God, I'm not gonna worship you for what you do. I'm going to worship you for who you are. It might not make sense right now. I might not understand the crisis that I'm in, but I'm gonna praise you and I'm gonna bless you for who you are, for your character, for your nature, for your goodness, for your grace. Even when it doesn't line up right now, even when I can't see it with my eyes, I'm still going to bless your name because I'm not praising God for what he does. I'm praising God, come on, for who he is. You know, this became so real to me. This became so real to me in the year of 2016. It was what I described the hardest year of my life. It's what I described to be my most recent valley. I was in a crisis of belief like I just described on the whiteboard a few moments ago. And it was um, not just the hardest year of my life when it came to ministry and really me just wrestling with a lot of different parts of my faith, but it was also the year where I lost my dad to addiction. So I want you just to help, to help you understand where I was um, so that this can, I can drive this point home. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a believer. I'm a pastoring at this time. I'm, I've given my, my life to God in this time. And here I have my dad who's been struggling with alcohol and struggling with his addiction for so many years. Now he's in this place where he's dying in a hospital and I'm by his side for about a week. And in this time, I'm praying, man, I'm pressing in. I'm, 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 I have my word open. I'm declaring his word. I'm declaring his promises over the life of my dad. And I'm believing for a miracle. Our community was backing us in prayer. And as I'm believing for a miracle, a few days passed. And now I have to prepare for the burial because my dad didn't make it. And in this, I had to question all of this. And my, my, my faith was wrecked and shattered at this time. And my two options that I thought I had was to just deny it and continue to live on cruise control or walk away from God because I feel like God had abandoned me. But instead, I leaned into my valley. I wrestled and I embraced. And in the hardest time of my life, I saw God closer than I've ever seen him before. And I grew so much because of what I was able to overcome and walk through. I didn't walk away. I leaned in and I embraced God. And in that time, God brought me here to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9 through 14. 
It says, for God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because his plan from before the beginning of time was to show his grace through, through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death and illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news. Come on, right there in your living room, say good news the good news and God chose me to be a preacher an apostle and a teacher of this good news verse 12 that this is why I, I am suffering in this prison but I am not ashamed of it for I know the the one in whom I trust come on this is what changed my life verse 12 for I know the one in whom I trust not what I trust not the ideas of Christianity, not the principles of Christianity, but the one in whom I trust, that I am sure that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him on the day that he may return. And verse 13, hold on to the pattern of wholesome teaching you learned from me, a pattern shaped by faith and love that you have in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives within us carefully guard Carefully guard the precious truth that has been entrusted to you. I had to come to understanding that what Paul, this ancient pastor, was teaching us was to say that our faith is not in what God does, but is in who God is. And he has entrusted this good news unto us. I love that word entrusted. It is to help us understand that even as bad as this COVID-19 news is that we're getting daily, come on, it is not tainting the good news of the gospel. The good news of the gospel will never be tainted. The fact that Jesus came, died, and rose again, and now that we can find new life in him through grace and faith alone. And then Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, know this. That God is entrusted you with this good news and he's guarding it. He is guarding the good news. And that word guard means this. It translates to expect, to bank on it. That God is still working to expect a miracle of God. That God is there still with you and he will entrust the good news. No matter what the crisis is, no matter what we're going through, it does not take away from the good news that we have in Jesus. Here's why. Because God is good. When it's great on the mountaintop or in the valley, God is good. So as I finish, here's two quick things you need to know. What do we do when we find ourselves in a valley? What do we do when we're in a crisis? Number one is this, remember. Habakkuk in the last chapter of his book says this in chapter 3 verse 2 I have heard all about you Lord I am filled with awe by your amazing works in this time of our deep need help us again as you did years ago help us again one of the greatest exercises you can do is to take a piece of paper get your journal and start thinking about your life start reflecting on your 31 years of existence when it relates to me right now and think about how many good things God has already done in my life when I didn't earn it or deserve it, how faithful he's been to me. When I deserved the worst, he made a way. When I needed a miracle, maybe it didn't happen when I wanted it to happen, but he still made a way. What a healthy practice it is for you and maybe your loved ones to sit around and think about how good God's been through your entire life. That's the first thing we do. We remember God's faithfulness. And number two, is we embrace. We remember and we embrace. Here's what you don't do in a valley. In a valley, you don't endure. Enduring is a passive response to something happening to you. We don't endure when, when we're in the valley. We embrace when we're in the valley. We lean, we lean into it. We dive into it. We embrace wholeheartedly when we're going through the crisis. Habakkuk says, I'm embracing you, God. Even here now, you are still on the throne. He says, he starts to describe in his last chapter all of the horrible situation that is around him. And he says, yet even though I see all of the cattle barns empty, all of the flocks dying, all of the olive crops, uh, olive crops failing, everything 
is in corruption yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. Come on, I think if you're following right now this conversation, maybe you need to make that declaration. Even though all of this is happening around me and I'm surrounded by it, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. That is a declaration that he gives out to God as a Shijanoth praise. From the depths of his soul, he cries that out. In chapter one, we see Habakkuk not quit. In chapter, two, in chapter two, we see him not walk away. And in chapter three, he has a brand new perspective. The last verse of his book in verse 19 says this, the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. What heights? The heights of your new mountain. That's the, what he's gonna give you the power and the strength to tread upon. I learn in moments like this, I've learned in crisis, like the one maybe you're facing today, like the one that I have faced, and I know in the future ones that I will face is, is this. I love to praise God for what he's done, for the blessing that's on my life, but it's in the valley that I get to know him for who he is. Job is an incredible figure in scripture. And just, just a man who loses so much. And if, if I think of the word suffering, I automatically think to this, to this person. And if you have a time, read that on your own. But the last chapter of Job, chapter 42, verse 5, he says one of the most profound things that I've ever heard in my life. He says this, I had only heard about you before, but now I have seen you with my own eyes. I have heard about you before. I've heard your voice, I've heard your cry, I've heard your songs of faith and victory through others, but now that I've gone through what I've gone through, I have seen you. I've seen you face to face. On the mountaintop, I can bless you and I can worship you and praise you because you are good, but in the valley, I get to know you in an intimate and profound way. Maybe you're here today and saying, Rich, man, that's me. I'm in that place where I have to make a choice whether I choose to wrestle and embrace, but I'm angry and I'm frustrated and I'm full of depression and full of anxiety. I am challenging you today to not walk away, not live in denial, but to wrestle and embrace because God is good, God is love, and God is victory. Come on, you will make it through. You will get past it. You're not just going to get it through the valley beaten, battered, and bruised. No, no, you're going to overcome that valley even when it's hard, even when it doesn't make sense. God has not left you. God is with you. And I want to leave you with this, with this beautiful um, song. It's called Highlands, and it was written by Hillsong Worship, and it has blessed me so much in this season. And I'm going to read you the lyrics, and maybe you can put it on, on your playlist later on in the next few days, but it says this, so I will praise you on the mountain and I will praise you when the mountain is in my way. You're the summit where my feet are. So I will praise you in the valleys all the same. No less God within the shadows, no less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is in the highlands and the heartaches all the same. Whatever I walk through, wherever I am, your name can move mountains wherever I stand. And if ever I walk through the valley of death, I'll sing through the shadows my song of ascent. From the gravest of all valleys come the pastures we call grace, a mighty river flowing upwards from a deep but empty grave. I want to pray with you. I want you to know that you're not alone. I want you to know that it is okay to wrestle and embrace when things don't make sense, when you're surrounded by a crisis like the one we're in today. It is okay to come to God. He can handle it. He can take it. He's got the bandwidth for you. And again, God loves you. God is good and God is victory. And so today I wanna lead you to know this God. Maybe you find yourself on the other side of the screen saying, man, Rich, I'm far from God. I've never known him personally in the way you describe him. I've never had a true, authentic relationship with God. I want to invite you today to know him in this way. 
I want to invite you today to know him in an intimate, personal relationship. The Bible says that it's a simple prayer. It is a changing of our heart to now going to surrendering to God and saying, God, I'm not going to live my life just the way I think I should live it or pilot my life, but I'm going to allow you to lead me. I'm going to surrender my life to you and I'm going to allow you to not only be my savior, but to be my father, even in good and in the bad. I want you with me. And so I want to invite you to pray. So right there where you're at, I want you to close your eyes for a moment, bow your heads and repeat after me. Say, Father, today is my day where I realize that I'm a sinner needing of a savior. Today, I have heard the good news, the news you entrusted to me. And today, I surrender to you. I repent of all my sin, past, present, and future. I receive you as my Lord and as my Savior. I am yours and you are mine in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on. Amen. I'm celebrating with you. I'm rejoicing with you. I believe this is the greatest decision any person can ever make. And we want to come alongside you. If today you decided to make Jesus your Lord and your Savior, if today you're deciding to join the conversation and say, man, I'm going to become a follower. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to put all the other ways aside and I'm going to follow the way. Well, not only do we want to let you know that we're praying for you, not only do we want to become your community, but we want to get a resource out to you called, um, which is what we call, the book is called Following Jesus. And it's an incredible resource to getting, to really starting and becoming established in Christ. We want to mail that out to you as soon as possible. But here's what you need to do. Text in the word established. The word established to the phone number 97000. Text us in. We're going to be automating something right back to you, congratulating you, celebrating with you, and then want to come alongside you and help answer any questions you might have. But maybe you're here today and you're saying, Rich, I'm not ready to start the conversation about Christ, but I am willing to continue the conversation of hope, continue the conversation of peace. We want to come alongside you and just drink some coffee virtually with you and continue the conversation. Text in the word generation home to the number 97000. I believe we're in this together. We're not called to do life alone. We're not called to be in this alone. We can be better together. I want to hear from you. I want to come alongside you. So many people have been asking in this season, obviously we're not gathering at church. We're not having public gatherings. That doesn't stop us from being the church. Come on, because the church is unstoppable. And I love Generation for its grit and its excellence and its passion. But so many people are asking, Rich, how can we continue to give? Right, we're not meeting on Sundays. How can we continue to be faithful with our giving and being generous and really just being the church in this time? Well, the good news is we've had this incredible digital platform that we've been using right since the beginning of our church. It's called Church Center App. You can actually download that on any device that you use. Search Generation Miami will pop up and it is the most easiest, convenient way to be able to still give and practice generosity or just visit our website, which is www.mygeneration.cc. You can hit the give tab right up there and also process your giving and your generosity now. You know, it is important that we continue to serve each other. It's, continue, it's important that we continue to be the church and it's important that we continue to lead the way with generosity. So take this time to worship with your giving. Take this time to get your family together. Maybe you're about to have your G Kids experience. We're super pumped about that. But we just want to let you know as we log off that I love you, that we love you, that you're not alone. We're for you. We're with you. We're a family that fights for families. And we know that God will make a way when it seems like there is no way. Thank you for tuning in to Generation at Home. Stay connected with us on all of our social media platforms. There's so many good things that we're bringing out in the next few days that is really going to bless you. But know that we're with you, that we love you, and God is for you. God bless you guys. See you soon.